Lord, I confess this morning that I am a child of weakness. My strength is indeed small. And apart from your rescue, I'm left hopeless and helpless. But Christ changes everything. Not only has he paid it all, he has accomplished everything that I could ever possibly need. It's already been done. And I pray that this morning your spirit would move in my life and the lives of others who are worshiping you today, that we would remember all that Christ has already accomplished. And that today we would, we would respond to you with a blessing. For you have been good to us indeed. So as we open your word, we ask that you would have your way with us. Shape us into the likeness of your son, Jesus. May his will be accomplished. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. You can be seated. So if your resolution, your New Year's resolution, was to attend your church regularly in 2022. Congratulations. You've made it one Sunday. Way to go. You're off to a good start. So you're to be commended for all of that. Uh, This may be the most optimistic weekend of the year for so many of us because we haven't had a chance yet to blow it in all of our New Year's resolutions. Maybe some of them, yes. But there's probably still some on the table that we're working on. And I know that we thought 2021 was going to be the year. It was not the year. 2022 is going to be the year. So let's just forget, you know, you get a pass on this past year. But 2022, this is going to be the year. And so as we start off this new year, I want us to focus this morning on praising the Lord and having a life of gratitude. If you have your Bibles, look with me in Ephesians chapter 1. Starting today, we're going to start a new sermon series on the book of Ephesians. This is going to take us up through uh, Easter, Lord willing. And this is an important book in the Bible as it has some extraordinary things that you and I need to be reminded of as followers of Christ. Uh, The city of Ephesus in the ancient world located in what is now Turkey. Uh, This is an important city, and Paul visited there on his third missionary journey. He spent three years there. You can read all about it in the book of Acts in the 19th chapter. And he developed a close relationship with the believers there. While he was in Ephesus, he taught about the Holy Spirit. He encountered opposition in the synagogue. He healed the sick. He cast out demons. He confronted extraordinarily powerful supernatural evil in a variety of forms, and the Lord showed himself to be greater than the powers of darkness. And many people confessed their sin. They left their old lives behind, and they turned to Christ for salvation. Paul was also a controversial figure in Ephesus. He incurred the wrath of many Greek businessmen and from the Jews. In fact, the silversmith named Demetrius stirred up a riot against Paul and his traveling companions, and they had to leave the city. Now, the book of uh, Ephesians, this was a letter written to the church there and to other churches in that area. It was written several years after Paul left the city, probably while he was imprisoned in Rome. And it has many important themes that you and I need to take hold of. But it was written to strengthen believers and their faith in Christ. And so I hope that that is one of the results of our time today and in the coming weeks as we study the book of Ephesians that our faith will be strengthened, our capacity to believe beyond what our eyes can see. Because sometimes what we see, not all that encouraging. But faith has the ability to see more to believe more, to trust more than what our eyes see at the moment. Another uh, theme in the book of Ephesians that I hope becomes real for us is that we will begin to understand the nature and the purpose of the church, the body of Christ. 
And as Paul wrote to the believers there in Ephesus and explained to them the things of what God had made real in their relationships with one another, he wanted that to strengthen and to encourage them. And I want that to be true for us as well. Right now, let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 3. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now let's pause just there for a moment. (coughs) Excuse me. Because Paul offers praise to God the Father for blessing us in Jesus Christ. He praises God. And it says that he, literally, he blesses God with praise. And that language has the idea of recognizing and attributing worth to God. Is God worth anything? Yeah, and so we praise Him because He is worthy of our praise and so much more. And it tells us that that praise is directed toward toward the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So why praise the Father of Jesus Christ? And Paul answers that. Because He has blessed us. And that word for blessing means that God has acted to our benefit so that we can prosper in some way and experience contentment. And the language, the language is in the past tense, which means that God has already blessed us. It's already occurred. And I want that to settle in on you. Because what that means is that God doesn't owe you anything else. He's already done everything that needed to be accomplished to bless you in Jesus Christ. God has blessed us through Christ's death on the cross. He has blessed us through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. We are blessed beyond measure by what God has already done for us in Christ. Are you following me there? One more thing he says. He says that God has blessed us in the heavenly places. What that means is that the way God has blessed us in Christ is a spiritual blessing. It's not material. Thus, the blessings that God has given us are eternal. And they are not tied to our lives or to our circumstances here on planet earth. Because we are all subject to the ebb and flow of the times in which we live. But the blessings that God has given us in Christ are not affected by what happens in this world. They are timeless and true and eternal. And you need to know that if you came here this morning looking for a a prosperity gospel message, you're in the wrong church. Because I'm not a big believer that God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and happy. Although those things are true, I think what you need to understand is that God has blessed us in Christ with spiritual blessings that are eternal and that will always be true. So as this new year begins, it seems right to join Paul in praising God for what He has already done for us in Christ. So what are those things that God has done for us that give us reason to praise Him today? Well, I want to mention three things in the text. First, let's read in verses 4 through 6. Ephesians 1, and we start reading in verse 4. It says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace which He has freely given us in the one He loves. All right, here's the first thing I want you to see today. That I can praise and give glory to God because He chose those who trust in Christ to be the recipients of His grace. And we were chosen in love. And God's choice brings glory to Him. Uh, That's a lot. For us to take in. And Paul's language is complicated and it's dense. It's packed with meaning. But what he's saying is is that God has chosen us in Christ to be the recipients of His grace. And He made that choice in love and that choice brings glory to Him. 
So let's look at the different things that Paul says here. First of all, he says we were chosen in Christ. We were chosen. The object of God's choice is us. And that is believers who are now who now belong to the people of God. We have received God's grace. And Paul's language says that God chose us corporately and individually. He chose all believers, all of those who trust in Christ, to receive God's grace. But it also means that individually, I have been chosen to be a part of the chosen group that Paul describes. Now I know that we can all get distracted by the language regarding predestination and being chosen and all of that. If you have questions about that, I told the early service that our youth minister, Wes Robbins, would be available afterwards to explain predestination to you. So write your questions down and submit those to him in triplicate today. Uh, I don't want you to get caught up in that. I want you to understand the grace that God has given us. And what he says is that I was chosen in Christ. Everything depends on my connection with Christ. And I need to focus on that. Everything that God has done for me, He's done for me through Jesus Christ. Also in verse 4, we see that we are chosen. We were chosen before the creation of the world. So before creation, before time began, when only God existed, that is when God conceived of His plan of salvation. That's when He understood Christ crucified and resurrected. See, the death and resurrection of Christ was always God's plan. It wasn't a correction to the plan. It was always the plan. And God made that plan before time began. And He didn't just make a plan. He followed through on it. Through all the eons of time that have passed, God has been following that plan and accomplishing His purposes. I can make a list for the day and get distracted before anything gets done. What about you? But God has never been distracted. He's never gotten off course. He made a plan and He followed through on it. And because of God's character, we can know that His plan is right. It's good. And it's perfect. There has never been an occasion where God has gone, oops. He's never had to adjust His course midstream. God is not one to build the plane while He's flying. He has made a plan. He is accomplishing it. And what He is doing is right and good and perfect. Now I admit that I am astounded by God's plan and I do not understand it. That doesn't mean it's wrong. God is good. He is right. He is perfect. He invites me to trust Him. Also, in verse 4, it tells us that we were chosen to be holy and blameless in God's sight. So this is the goal of God's plan, for God's people to be holy and blameless before Him. What that means, that in, is, it means that in Christ, God repairs the damage and separation caused by sin, and He restores us to the place for which He created us, that we would be like the Son and dwell in God's presence now and forever. And the Bible says that I cooperate with this transformation of holiness in my life. I'm called to be holy. And so I must allow the Spirit to use God's Word to refine me over time so that I will become more and more like Christ. Verse 5 tells us that God predestined us to be His children through adoption in Christ. And He did this in love for His own pleasure because God wanted it. And although our sin separated us from God, making us God's enemies and objects of His wrath. In Christ, we are adopted by God into His family as His children. We were once His enemies. Now, we are family. We are His children. And God took this action, Paul says, out of love. Out of love for us and love for His Son, Jesus. God took this action because it pleased him. It gave him pleasure. And it signifies his delight that he takes in us and in his son, Jesus Christ. And God took this action because of his will. It was what he planned. It was what he intended. It was what he wanted done. 
And verse 6 tells us that this was done to bring praise to the grace God gave us in Jesus Christ. It is through grace that we are saved. The forgiveness of our sin is in accordance with the riches of divine grace. All is grace. I did not earn or accomplish my forgiveness, my salvation, my new life, my eternal life. All of that is a gift of God that I did not earn and did not deserve. The fact that that is true, Paul says, should cause us to respond with praise to God. Is there anybody here who has received God's grace? If that's true, then we have ample reason to rise in this place and bless God. Because we've received what we do not deserve. And we do not receive what we do deserve. That is grace. And it should cause us to sing His praise. You know what happened in my neighborhood on Christmas morning? (coughs) You're not going to believe this. But about 8 o'clock on Christmas morning, all the children in my neighborhood came out of their homes, went out in the street, and had an impromptu parade for their parents. It was beautiful. My own children stood in our front yard and shouted for everybody to hear about how good their parents had been to them on Christmas, even though they didn't deserve it. And my children sang praises to me. (laughs) Why are you laughing? You're laughing because you know it's not true. (laughs) That has never happened in the history of the world on any street in any neighborhood. Children have never done that. But they should. (laughs) And what Paul is saying is, is that we have reason to gather in a room like this on a day like this and give praise and worship to God. Why? Because of the grace God has given us in Jesus Christ. We already have it. It's been done. We have reason to stand and bless the Lord because He has been good to us indeed. So here's the question. Am I ready to begin 2022 by giving praise to God for His grace through Jesus Christ. Are you ready to start this year out praising the Lord for what He has already done for us in Christ? Now here's the second thing I want you to see. I can praise God for the forgiveness of my sin through Jesus Christ and for all its implications in my life and in the church. Let's look in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. <clears throat> it says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. So here, Paul again layers on deep meaning about what God has accomplished for us in Christ. In verses 7 and 8, we see that sin is forgiven in Christ through His death on the cross. This was an act of grace accomplished according to God's sovereign plan. And what Paul is saying is that redemption or liberation from bondage to sin, bondage to the flesh, bondage to my uh, sin nature and to this world, all of that has already been accomplished. I've been set free. And that freedom is a possession I have right now because of what God has done for me through Jesus Christ. So how did Jesus rescue us? Paul says it was through His blood shed on the cross. Jesus rescued us from God's judgment on our sin. Words are hardly adequate for Paul to describe the inexhaustible nature of God's generosity 
to us through Christ. He describes it as riches. And that's an understatement of all that we've received because of Christ. In verses 9 and 10, we see that God has created for Himself one unified people. A mystery revealed in the church right now and fulfilled at the end of all things. So Paul is saying that God's saving purposes, planned from eternity, had as their final goal the uniting of all things in the universe under or in Jesus Christ. So right now, if you look at our fractured world and our fractured lives and our fractured families and all of the broken relationships and all of the hatred and the discord and all of the effects of our sin, Paul is saying that there's coming a day when all of that will be done away with and everyone and everything will be brought together again in Christ. And what happens in the church, Paul says, is just a a, a glimpse of the unity that God will accomplish at the end of all things because of Christ. And Paul uses the word mystery here to describe the perfect, all-inclusive, eternal plans of God which are beyond our comprehension. It's a mystery. The unity that we're all going to see when Christ returns is a mystery that's difficult for us to comprehend. But on that day, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And Paul says we get a glimpse of that unity in the church right now. And he mentions Jews and Gentiles and later men and women and those who are slaves and those who are free. All of these different groups of people who have nothing in common except one thing, and that is Christ. And they are all united together in the local church as one because of Christ. Not because of culture, not because of politics, not because of worship styles, or you name it. What unites them together? Christ. And Christ is enough to unite people together in one purpose, in one heart, in one mind. And Paul says one day, God's going to sum up all of these things in Christ, and He's going to put back together again all of the relationships and all uh, that, that our, our sin has broken. And when will that be accomplished? And Paul says when the times have reached their fulfillment. Literally, when everything is right according to God's plan and purposes. Probably that day is not today. But the day is coming when everything that's been made wrong in this world will be made right again. And the church is to be just a small glimpse to the world of the unity that God will bring when Christ returns. So the question is, am I ready to begin 2022 by praising God for the forgiveness of my sin and for being made a part of His people forever? Am I ready to praise God, not just for the forgiveness of my sin, but for uniting me together with other believers in the body of Christ. All right, one more thing I want you to see before we're done today. And it's this. I can praise God for the Holy Spirit who is a down payment in my life, proving the reality of what God has accomplished for me in Christ and guaranteeing God will keep all His promises to me in Christ. Look at chapter 1, verse 11. It says, in Him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of His glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed You were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. Uh, There's all kinds of things here Paul says. And again, I don't want us to get distracted by this whole language 
of predestination and being chosen. Wes is the one who's going to explain that to you later. What I want you to see is what he's saying the Holy Spirit has accomplished for us as believers, what it means for us. So in verses 11 through 13, we see that believers who hear and believe the gospel message receive the Holy Spirit who makes real the presence and power of God in the life of the believer. In the New Testament, the proof of our faith in Christ is found in the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So in the book of Acts, for instance, the apostles testified not only to the death and resurrection of Christ, but also to the presence of the Spirit in the lives of believers. They saw this first among the Jews there at Pentecost, and then later they saw it in the lives of Gentile believers in Acts chapter 10. The presence of the Spirit made real the fact that they had been saved through their faith in Jesus Christ. And what happens is, Paul says, people heard the gospel, they believed the truth, they trusted in Christ for salvation, their sins were forgiven, they received the Holy Spirit and were made new, given new life in Christ, a life that never ends. Paul says the Holy Spirit is a seal for believers. That word means ownership and protection. In the ancient world, cattle and even slaves were branded with a seal, and that brand provided identity and protection for the property. You knew who, to whom it belonged, and you knew what would happen to you if you messed with it. Now, it's not yours. It's somebody else's. And you have to pay a price if you steal the property or damage it in some way. And Paul says that by giving us the Spirit, God seals or stamps our lives as His own. He claims us as His own. And that means He will protect us through the trials and testings of this life until the day he takes us to be with Him forever. And in verse 14, it tells us that the Holy Spirit is a guarantee to the believer that God will complete what He began in the believer's life. So the Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. By giving us the Spirit, God is not simply promising us our final inheritance, but actually providing us with a foretaste of that inheritance. It, we begin to enjoy the Lord's presence now, but what we experience here now is just a small part of what it's going to be like when we go to be with Him forever at the end of all things. The Spirit received is the first installment and guarantee of the inheritance that we will get in the age to come. The inheritance that awaits all of God's children. The Holy Spirit means that God has claimed us. We are His, and He will hold on to us forever. <clears throat> I told the early service that when I was in college, my best friend, Dan, uh, was in a fight one day with his roommate, Blake, because Blake kept eating Dan's Oreos without paying Dan for them. And I want you to know, we were poor college students. We were ministerial students on top of that. We didn't have a whole lot of money. And so Dan didn't buy cheap, generic cookies. He splurged for the Oreos. And they were disappearing. Why? Because his roommate was eating them and not paying them for him. And so they were fighting about this, and Blake refused to stop. And so what Dan did was, he opened up the bag of Oreos on his bed. He took each one of them and licked both sides. <laughs> and put them back in the bag. And by doing that, he was claiming them as his. This is mine. And he'd put them back, and by doing that, he guaranteed that Blake would not eat them, and he was right. <laughs> and by doing that, Dan also got a small taste of each Oreo, and he could look forward to eating all of them without sharing with anyone, because they were his. He had bought them. He was going to enjoy them himself. And this is what Paul is saying, that this Holy Spirit is a down payment in your life. It means that God has claimed you as His own. You are His. And He will protect you. He will preserve you as His own forever. And when the day comes, He will come and get you. And you will be with Him in eternity. 
And the presence of the Spirit now in your life means that you get just a small taste of what it's going to be like to be in the presence of the Lord for all eternity. As good as God's presence is now, it's nothing compared to the reality that awaits us when we go to be with Him forever. And the question is, am I ready to begin 2022 by praising God for claiming me as his own and giving me the Spirit to prove it? Am I ready to praise the Lord for claiming me as his own? So this morning, as we conclude, I want to invite you to make two different kinds of commitments today. First of all, I invite you to trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Believe that His death on the cross means your sin is forgiven. And believe that His resurrection will be your destiny. Believe that new life is possible because of Christ. If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, why not today? And if you've never made that public, that you are trusting in Christ and that you're a Christian, why not today? Start the, day, start the new year off by making Jesus your Savior and your Lord. Second, I invite you to willingly offer praise to God for His grace to you in Jesus Christ. Make a commitment to live a life of gratitude each day. Look, uh, this is hard, especially with the things that many of us have gone through and continue to walk through. This can be a real challenge. But I want you to know that everything Paul has told us about what God has done for us in Christ is settled and it's final. It's already been done and it will always be true and nothing can ever change it for you. And that is reason to celebrate. Today and every day, regardless of our circumstances, the, the ebb and flow of this world cannot change what God has done for us in Christ. And I want to hold that truth in my heart. And I want to face and respond to each new day out of that place in my life. And even just to, to offer gratitude even just for one part of each day, because the Lord is worth it. Because His grace is worth it and is worth celebrating, regardless of what's happening. Because of Christ, I have reason to celebrate, to pause and be thankful, and to live out of that place in my life. So, in a moment, I'll pray. And then our praise team will come and lead us in this time of response. And I wonder, how do you need to respond to the word of the Lord? While we're singing, you can do that. You can, you can do that right where you are. If you feel led, you can come to the altar and kneel and pray. I'll be standing down front. If uh, you wanted to come and pray with me while we're singing, when the, when the service is over, I'm going to be out in the foyer for a time. If you want to find me out there and ask questions or tell me what God is saying to you, I would love to hear from you. I wonder, how do you need to begin this new year by responding to the word of the Lord? Let's pray together. Lord, we want to acknowledge your grace poured out on us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Your grace is filled with riches beyond imagination more than we deserve, beyond what we could ever hope for apart from Christ. And so I pray the reality of what you've done for us in Christ would be made very, uh, very relevant, very real for those who are worshiping you today. Help them to understand, to believe, to trust. And may it fill them with gratitude and joy. Lord, I pray that we would willingly live in each new day of this year out of the gratitude that we, that we have for what you've done for us in Christ. 
You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our worship. You are worthy of our honor. And I confess that I get distracted by the things of this world and the things that swirl in and out of my life at any given time. And I pray, Lord, that you would increase my capacity to see, to perceive, to believe, and to shape my life as a response of love to all that you've accomplished for me in Christ. And I pray now that you would speak into the lives of those here and those who are watching online. May your will be accomplished in them and through them. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me while we sing? And I hear the Savior say, My strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in today to start off this new year by worshiping the Lord. I pray that the Lord would bless you greatly in the days to come. Our uh, Deacon of the Week is Tim J. Rowe. He's going to come and lead us in a word of prayer, or close us in prayer today. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, Lord, we come to you at this time thanking you for the day, thanking you for the things you do for us, for the message you provided through our pastor, and for this church, and peace that we can have when we come together to worship you here. We thank you, Lord, for a new year, and we won't miss the last two. We ask God that you watch over us and care for us through this coming year, and we don't know what it will bring, but we pray, God, that whatever comes, that you remind us every single day of your love for us and fill us with your peace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Praise Him, praise Him.